Hello and welcome to Jam Hack, the podcast where we talk all things Jamstack. <laughs> uh, my name is Hunter Miller, and I'm a senior software engineer at This Dot. And today I'll be your host. Um, we are joined by Jay Phelps, who helped co-found This Dot, which is awesome. Um, he also helped co-found OutSmartly, which is his current company that he's working with. Um, Jay, how are you doing? Good, good, Hunter. Thanks for having me on. So glad to have you. Um, since this is our first episode, um, maybe just a little bit about what we're trying to do here. So everyone at this thought, or at least the engineers anyway, um, kind of felt like there was a lot of confusion around the term Jamstack. And so um, it seemed like it could apply to a lot of different things. And so we wanted to kind of take this as an opportunity to like explore all the different possibilities, what falls in the category, what doesn't, um, maybe share like some strategies that people have been using like Jay um, or tech that they're building for the, you know, for Jamstack sites. Um, and we just really want to help the community kind of do the best that they can with this kind of new paradigm. Um, so something that we're hoping to make a recurring bit on the show. Yeah, it's awesome. Jay, these are always so what, much fun. What do you define the Jamstack as? Uh, yeah, so it. I'll I'll start by prefacing saying that that Jamstack is one of those terms where it's like it hasn't quite like. The people who came up, came up with the term to have a very clear definition in their mind, but then everyone mm -hmm. else who's kind of co-opted that term to some extent. So like yeah. some people interpret it as essentially that Jamstack is just basically the same thing we've been doing all, all along. It's just JavaScript and HTML and, 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 and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's just yeah. like a way to describe the new, you know, sort of thing. I mean, I I think that the people who came up with the folks at Netlify who came up with the term originally, I think I think that they would probably disagree with that. That it's the, at least in spirit, what it's trying to describe. I think um, for me is really a focus. the The primary thing is the focus on the static site generation, doing or or at the bare minimum, doing as much work ahead of time as possible, or caching mm, it heavily, yeah. or 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 whatever. Like there's, you know, like there are people. Like when I say caching it heavily, I mean like, so if you do static site generation in the sense of like you have a build process and that build process then generates the HTML ahead of time for every single page and then pushes those resulting artifacts to like a CDN or something like that. That's static site generation. But what's really the difference from the user's perspective is if if you had just done server side rendering, but then just cache the result, right. um, like like you know like Next has incremental static site re regeneration or Remix, um, a new React framework that's just like basically just purely server side rendering, but they are making caching a much more first party thing, or first class thing, I guess not first party, but. Um, so really, there isn't. I mean, it depends, right? Like there's con there's conceptual differences, but then like in practice, the result can be effectively the same. But so I still consider like if you like, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm not necessarily a purist. I agree with the idea. I, like mm, I think that yeah. they, they assume they're all about doing stuff ahead of time and caching static site generation, static site generation and that sort of stuff. I think it's fine personally for my definition of it to include things like remix as long as you are in fact doing caching heavily, like really heavily, not just mm. like, oh, I'm caching it for a few seconds sort of thing. Um, Cause it it's is. all about convenience, right? Like doing something like that versus doing actual static site generation can have pros and cons. Like there's a lot of convenience to just generating the page a la carte and then caching it forever or doing stale yeah. while we validate or, or, or all these sorts of things. And I think it's somewhat unproductive to just be like, well, you know, like as an example, Next.js can do static site generation, but it can also do regeneration and server-side server -side rendering. It seems weird to be like, if you start your app completely doing static site generation, you start your website completely static site generation, but then all of a sudden flip a switch and now you're doing static site regeneration, to all of a sudden be like, you're no longer Jamstack. Like, like, like <laughs> sorry, you just, you're no you're longer. something else. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it just seems weird because it's like from the user's perspective, it's the exact same thing. Right. It's, really, it's really more of a con convenience factor of infrastructural, like, you know, so that you don't have to regenerate the entire, you know, 
website all at one. And in a lot of cases, that's impractical when you've got thousands upon thousands of products and stuff like that. Anyway, so that's, I feel like the biggest key is doing as much work, stack side generation, that sort of thing. Do as much as you can ahead of time. Um, uh, yeah, then there's the, the, the focus a lot on headless APIs, which is somewhat of a term that is fairly new. And it took me a while to understand to really, cause like headless is a great, like it's a great term if you're a startup and you want to get funding and stuff like that, adding right. yourself, like you're a headless X, whatever that is, whatever X is. Um, <laughs> when in fact, like we've been doing headless things for like forever. Like it just means yeah. an API, right? Just like, <laughs> I get it, I get, right. it. Like, I get it. Like I'm being, I'm, you know, more being pedantic and just making a joke, but there is a big shift to basically saying the things that you would usually have created a UI for instead just expose API and let yeah. the tooling, you know, consume that API directly. Um, so I don't know. I mean, maybe a that, little like looser coupling between everything. Yeah. 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 That's the, I think that's the big, that's a good way of putting it. That's the big focus I think is with the headless and all that is just, to decouple those things so that you can use the best tool for the job. I mean, right. like, like for example, case in point, Contentful being like an incredibly popular, well, I mean, relatively in the war, in that world, uh, headless CMS. And so like, but let's say that you were trying to do AB testing or you were trying to do your, actually a really great example is like Shopify versus uh, Contentful. Like imagine if it's all bolted into one, your, your head, your CMS, and your store and, and your inventory management and all that stuff, all is in the same thing as a traditional model might have been. Mm -hmm. Well, now what if their, their store, like what if Shopify really does a great job at making their store, but not really a great job of all the other, can, all the other CMS side of things, you know, like supporting exactly. for maybe testing or plugin systems. So now in, instead you can basically just use the right tool for the, use the best tool for the, for the job. Like in the sense of Contentful focuses on being the best headless CMS. Shopify ho focuses on being the best e-commerce headless API. They also have the non-headless stuff with the liquid um, templates and stuff. But, um, and so I see those kind of combinations a lot. That's a really common one. But then there's other stuff too. There's feature flagging, maybe testing, you know, all sorts of oh, yeah. data, data, data <laughs> analytics and, and insights and all that stuff. So um, I think those are the biggest things. I'm, I'm not I know. Well, what did it what did it used to stand for? Um, I know Jamstack used to be an acronym, but then they decided to not make it an acronym. Like it used to be all caps J A M, and then they, they decided they said now it's camel K or just normal case. Yeah, like just J, like lower, capital J and then lowercase A M. So JavaScript APIs, a, APIs, and, and markup. And markup. Yeah. yeah, I think that sounds right. Yeah. Which, right? <laughs> like you were saying earlier. It's Maybe kind of what we were doing, but yes, there's a whole, a whole reason behind it all. Um, yeah. Why do you uh, think we maybe got to this point? Why is that what you said? Right. Yeah. Why yeah. did Why did Jamstack come about? Um, somewhat of as a pullback, ironically, like in the sense of, so, you know, there was all server side. At least this is my opinion. This is not facts, but my opinion is that it's somewhat of an odd pullback from. We, you know, we started the web with like, everything's completely static. Here's an HTML file, sprinkle in some JavaScript for some dynamic content. Then we kind of shifted things from, they had the whole PHP renaissance, right? Where we shifted things, shifted a lot of stuff to being dynamically done at the, on the server and, and all your, yeah, all the server side stuff. Everyone, you know, if you've been doing web for a while, you remember that. And that's still popular today, just to be clear. I mean, PHP is wildly popular. You know, all the ASP and all that stuff is still very, very popular. So I think it's easy to discount it, especially on like Twitter. Um, oh, like yeah. The, the Twitter time. community and stuff. <laughs> like it's, it's easy to like pretend that that doesn't exist when in fact it very much exists. Yeah. Um, but then there was kind of the next kind of renaissance was the, the client side single page app type of thing, right? Like what, when that was, you know, because simply browsers just got faster, JavaScript actually got fast. And so there was some things you could do client side that actually would be faster for, as an example, the client side routing, right? So after yeah. you've loaded up the page initially, from then on out, you could do some things faster by just keeping it client side because you could just make API calls and maybe you already have the templates client side or whatever. Maybe you don't, or even if you don't, there's less work you have to do, blah, 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 blah. Um, but then people kind of realized that, like it kind of got to, 
the, it kind of got too extreme. Like we, we doubled down on JavaScript too much in my, in, in, at least I think that that's what people would say. Um, and so then our, our websites became incredibly bloated and just massive, uh, tons and tons of JavaScript. And as the same time, whereas before the web, when web apps were becoming a thing, um, people were really targeting like desktops, right? And so the, the worst thing you had to deal with was Internet Explorer, which wasn't a bad thing, but it was like, <laughs> that was what you had to deal with is, does it run okay on Internet Explorer? You didn't have to deal with like, you did have to deal with Internet speeds, but honestly, Internet speeds were not that bad back then. Like they were actually pr pretty fast. Yeah. And then, um, but concurrently to that, basically we were, as we were increasing the amount of JavaScript, concurrently the average developers or our average uh, device and stuff got slower and slower and, and, and internet got slower and slower because of mobile, you know, mo more traffic shifted over to mobile faster than the mobile devices could keep up with the demand of JavaScript. Um, especially once, developers. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. Especially once Android came out, then it was just yeah. like, boom, like tons of the, the, you know, you could buy cheap or free phone. You could get free phones that, that are, that um, are running Android and able to run all these apps the problem is they're not able to run them good. Like, you Correct. know, they don't. And um, especially, you know, with there's emerging markets, you know, and in, in various countries that didn't have good internet before are now starting to get better internet, but there's still issues with them and blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's kind of my quick gist of that is just, and then so the pullback was essentially real, the realization that pages are the first visit of a page is by far the most important of most. Um, e-commerce websites like there's some things like like for as an example if you if you're if you're writing autocad for the web like you're literally writing the application autocad for the web how long it takes you to download that thing probably doesn't matter to some to, no. to, to, to a general extent i mean like you know like there's an egregious amount right you know if it's five if it's like a, a gig or a, even 500 megabytes that's you're probably gonna run into other issues too with memory and all sorts of other things but the point being is that applications true applications where someone spends a lot of time in it um, where basically they boot it and then they run it. Um, people have a much higher tolerance and ex also an expectation of things taking taking longer. Not that you shouldn't try to get them down. It's just, but that, so we focused way too much on that use case when in fact, most people don't have that use case. Most people have the use case of, I am have an ad on Facebook and pe I want people to click on that ad, come to my website and buy my thing. Like, like that's a, you know, a hugely popular use case. The problem with that is that, that most of those visitors now are first time users, first time visitors. They've never visited there before at all. So they have no such thing as a cat. They have no cash, any of that <laughs> stuff. They're probably coming from mobile. Um, and to make things even worse, some of these embedded browsers in these applications can run at worse performance. And th that's yeah. gotten somewhat better. You know, that Safari is, in, uh, Apple's now, you know, provided the WK, I think it's WK, it's been a while since I've done uh, iOS, but I think it's WK web view or whatever, but the old one was super slow. Anyway, so I, I, I sometimes get on tangents, but the point being okay. <laughs> is that um, there's been a big pullback because they realized the people have realized the value of that first interaction. And so static site generation kind of goes in the opposite direction of, and, and, and Jamstack in general, um, kind of goes in the opposite direction of focusing on, focusing heavily on that first interaction. But instead of switching back to the serve, to purely traditional server side thing, it kind of takes a hybrid approach. It's like, well, we can use the existing JavaScript tooling that we've come to know and love, but take a, you know, build step, like really rely on build steps and caching and those sorts of heavy things. And then just interactivity happens with rehydration and client side navigation and that sort of stuff. Um, so it's an interesting, it's a, it's a different pair. It is also a different paradigm. Um, I'm still, I think we're not there yet. Like in the sense of, I think the, the way Jamstack works today, I think is still somewhat missing the mark, but I think we're moving in the right direction and, like not, not not necessarily stack side generation. I just mean that like moving in the right direction of reducing as much, or reducing our, our dependency on JavaScript on that first page at least, yeah. um, doing as much work ahead of time, caching, reliance on CDNs and edge compute and these sorts of things. I think you're right in that. I don't think we've seen we we haven't gotten to the quite the sweet spot. I think we're close. Um, like you know we're seeing React server components 
um, and frameworks like Remix and like some other, and even Next.js, you know, they're all starting to give us little bits and pieces of functionality that say, oh, I want to tune this, mm. you know, one direction or the other, right? I want to, maybe this should go server side and that's the best use case or right. maybe this should go client side. Um, and I've seen lots of I mean, great experiments, experiments at least in, in, in a better direction, like in the view community. And then also there's like a ton, there's always a ton of bespoke, like brand new UI frameworks that basically, you know, start over from scratch sort of thing like Marco and solid and all these other mm -hmm. similar type of things. Um, and there's been some really cool experiments with that they've shown, like I, the, I'd say the most obvious next thing that probably will be landing in some of these frameworks in the next year or two, at least I would guess, considering I've done experiments, everyone else has done experiments. It's like one of the most experimented thing ever. And that's don't ship JavaScript that you don't need. Like, like, yeah. and, and that seems like an obvious statement, but it's just like, you know, you build your whole page using JavaScript. And then you ship the entire JavaScript bundle that was used to build that page when in fact, majority of that page was static. Like it was just normal static HTML. And why are we <laughs> shipping JavaScript for that? Um, and so that could like, especially if you're an e-commerce, like imagine you have a e-commerce, you're an e-commerce company, you got a marketing website, you know, the .com basically. Mm -hmm. Someone comes in, honestly, on an average marketing website, how much JavaScript do you really need clients? Right. Like very little. Maybe you've got a, maybe on mobile you got a, a, a slide out menu, which ironically you can actually even do with CSS. You can use with active states and, and yep. you know, but but um, but still, let's say and let's we'll say auto suggest for your search and you know those sort of things. But very little JavaScript and most of those interactivity things are 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 things that can be delayed quite a bit. Like in the sense of you know someone is, mm -hmm. is less likely to interact with it immediately. Um, but a vast majority of your page is not JavaScript, so it does feel very painful to write it all in JavaScript and then send down that bundle, you know, that 30 or 40 K I'm being, I'm being nice. Like it's usually much higher than that. Yes, um, right, even exactly. in these, in these worlds, but it's still like 30 or 40 K on a desktop, whatever. Right. But 30 or 40 K on mobile does make a difference, you know, and, and, and that was being generous to most of the time when you, you got multiple chunks, each chunk is 30 or 40 K. One of them might be a hundred K, um, you know, even with tree shaking, um, and tree shaking is also not foolproof and it's also super, super easy to get your, your, your app into a state that's like great. And then it regresses later because you're not constantly looking at that bundle mm, size true. and looking at what things are getting tree shaken. Cause it's like, it's like you have to walk on eggshells to make sure that a module doesn't just, you know, whoops, <laughs> now it's the optimizing can't be tree shaken. Well, yeah, exactly. Like in that case, it's not even in your hands a lot of time. Um, you know, it's up to the library authors or or that, um, you know, I had the fun experience of trying to build a e-commerce store for my dad. So it was a side project, but I kind of tried to, I guess, do what you just said, which was how do we only ship the JavaScript we need? Um, so I went like the 11 D route. And then I just did a little bit of Alpine here and there, kind of like old school, but it's new school because of mm -hmm. it's like, I don't know. I don't know how to say it. Like, you know, you're binding directly on the elements. You're using a little bit of virtual. So it's not like jQuery, um, nothing against jQuery, but just anyway, the point yeah. being that like, even that was tough. Um, and so if you're trying to do this like automatically for people, I can only imagine, you know, where that would go. I'm and that's sure the there's... real reason. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like, like, like that's the reason why it's like, why people ask like, well, why I, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten in discussions where people are like, are like, well, why aren't people doing that? Why aren't people just generating their page with HTML and then adding sprinkling JavaScript manually here or there? And the main reason, well, I, there's lots of reasons Then some are valid, more valid than others. But the main reason, in my opinion, is productivity. It's just like people learn the tools and they get used to these things that, you know, they want to, they want to bring in, they're like, oh, I need, I'm going to need a, 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 an auto suggest component. And it's like, well, I know React and, and I know React will work well. And there's a React component for this. Boom, I pull it in and I use it. Like, I know that's not a great excuse, but it is, a, but it is an excuse. And well, then on top yeah. of that, there's, there's things like it is, it, it's, there is something br somewhat brittle about separation of those things. Like, like separating those concerns in that way, I think is somewhat 
like it's what we used to do, right? You'd, H, you'd write your yeah. HTML and use a query selector and then you do that stuff. But separating those concerns can have issues because then it's like, well, if you go and update the HTML, then you have to go and update the selector, right? What, otherwise, what if, you, what if you break that or whatever? And it's very easy to have that out of sight, out of mind sort of thing. So you have to be very diligent. And again, that's not, not doable. Tons of people do do this and it, and it does work. Um, but I think that's part of it. There's also the, I mean, I'll acknowledge it. There's, there's the, there's the, um, uh, how do I say this diplomatically? I guess there isn't a really good way to diplomatically say it. There's the, there's the engineering tendency of people. Like they, people want to work oh, yeah. on cool things. They want to build with the latest and greatest and the cool application, you know, like it's like the whole app versus website thing. You know, people, some people feel like it's an offensive thing to call something a website and not an application. And, mm, uh, you know, yeah, it's like, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, it's like, I, I, I don't see, I, I get, I, I get why people say that, but I feel like just calling your, your website an application does not make it more complicated. I mean, like, but, but pulling in next JS and pulling in all these other things absolutely does. So that, I guess that's case in case in point, I guess that go, works against my argument in the sense of that's what people are doing is they're like, I want to feel like I'm writing an app and I want to get good experience and have those experience be transferable to further employers. Um, but I, 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 I know that 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 you know people watching this. I don't want you to feel like I'm like calling everyone out or something like that. Like I mean, it's a perfectly valid thing. I over-engineer things all the time too, but um, I think the biggest. I think that that's more of a uh, like a secondary thing. I think the biggest thing is the productivity that that these new frameworks give you. Um, yeah, having them all in one. And so eventually, when we get to a point where they're going to be able to do these things for you, either automatically or with minor annotations. Like most of the proof of concepts I've seen so far use some sort of annotation, like whether it be like you, you have a comment or you hire, you have a higher order component thing or whatever it is, you somehow tell a compiler that like this component should be client side and this component should be server side or, or, or statically generated or whatever. And you shouldn't send the JavaScript for that. Um, and that's what I'm, I think we're really what we got to get to. I think trying to push everyone away from these frameworks, like, you know, yeah, I don't uh, think that's the move. <laughs> Nuxt and, and, and next. And like, I don't think, I think that, that's, yeah, I think that's not the move. So. Yeah. I think like there, there's some, I think there's always been, even before maybe React, there's always been kind of a tension uh, between kind of doing things, you know, the more modern way versus kind of the old way. Um, and that's, mm -hmm. you know, still existing to this day. Um, right. Always. Um, unfortunately, trying to drag us away from the tools that we love. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. I, I mean, there are, there are, I think that there's both ways. There's going to be people who, who, um, I, I can think of a couple people who are just very diehard. Like we shouldn't be using next. We shouldn't be using any of this, we should start with HTML and that's what we should start with. And then if you need interactivity, you sprinkle in JavaScript, just like the back in the day. You I mean what we did back in the day. Um, and there's some, like I said, there's some truth to that. Um, it's trade-offs, you know? And, exactly. You know, at the end there's, of the day, it's a case by case basis. I think any blanket statement I think is just, you know, not accurate. Right. You can't always follow some kind of dogma. Um, I think it's, you know, you have to talk about complexity, like at what level is that okay? Mm -hmm. You know, at what level of complexity is sprinkling in JavaScript into some HTML okay? Right. And at what point does it become unmanageable and more complex? It's just downstream, you know? Right. And it's like at the end of the day, like, okay, let's say I, I build, I need to build like an e-commerce website or whatever that has thousands of products or something like that. Like, Obviously, I, it's, it's thousands of products. I can't like not use some sort of templating language. You know, like I can't just mm -hmm. write HTML. So if you're using a templating language, that means you you have some sort of programming language is doing something. Like something. Even if you didn't write the code, there is someone has code, right? You're, even if it's a CLI, I've never actually seen this. But even if it's just like you write templates and a CLI just does it, and you have no idea how it works. Uh, but in practice, it's it's more like you're writing PHP or you're writing JavaScript on Node or something like that. And then at the end of the day, you'll 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 eventually be like, well, I now I need loops and now I need conditionals mm -hmm. and now I need X Y Z. And then eventually you get to the point where you're like, well, now I want interactivity and now I have to put I've got all this 
logic and it's almost Turing complete. And then I've got my other code off to the side that like I, in, that I have to maintain. And like, it just becomes like pretty obvious of why we are the way we are in the sense of like mm -hmm. a lot of cases, not all of them, but a lot of cases, it's just easier just to start with something like next. And if, even if you don't need it, you have it, you know, you have that power. Um, and that's just an easy, it just, it just, um, yeah, just easier to, to, um, what am I trying to say? It's nice to have something and not need it and then need it to not have it. Right. That's the old saying, right. This applies in this situation as well. And so I think that's the primary reason why, um, that these frameworks are so popular. So they will solve that. I'm, I'm pretty confident that these Nuxts and these Nexts and these Gatsby's and, and what have you and Svelts and, you know, I can't think of what's what's the Svelte equivalent of, of Next and Nuxt. Um, I, I think one. recently SvelteKit. SvelteKit, thank you, that was it. Yeah. Yeah, so. It used um, to be Sapper, but they scrapped it or Sapper. something. Oh, I didn't hear that. Yeah. yeah. That was like um, the OG. <laughs> but yeah, there's, I mean, there's a bajillion, you know, sort of things. And then there's always going to be like, things that are still not necessarily like I haven't seen angular in this world very much. Like, I, and, and that's not surprising to me because angular is kind of philosophically more targeted in my opinion. I don't want to speak for the core team. I'm just saying from my opinion, right. philosophically more targeted towards applications, like true applications where it's like you download this thing and then you live in it. Um, even if it's, you know, just for 10 or 20 minutes, but it's not like a, a transactional nature. Like I, I clicked on your ad and I came in and I bought the thing and then I'm gone. Um, exactly. Yeah, you're so not I, you're not standing up ser services and controllers and all that just for. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of ceremony just yeah. for 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 that. I mean, but the ceremony can pay off dividends on these really complicated apps. At least some people exactly. believe it does. You know. But yeah. um, do you uh, do you think that this chase for performance is is fruitful? You know, in the end, <laughs> are we? Are we chasing something that we can never be fulfilled by? Yeah, I mean, I don't. I, mean, I guess in the literal sense, I, I don't. I don't ever see a time where we're going to be like, you know, we're done. Like everything <laughs> is as fast as it, everything is is as fast as it needs to be, and and making something faster is going to be meaningless. I, like I don't see that. As, um, but especially like, I know some people. I've. I've talked to a couple of people on Twitter about this before, like this topic has come up before and some people disagree with my opinion, but I feel like a big part of this is also that not only have, so computers have gotten faster, but so have the requirements have gotten more, more, more um, uh, difficult and, and yeah. computationally intensive. Like, and we've also, you know, like I just, I remember back in, you know, like Gmail was probably one of the big, like one of the biggest first applications yeah, of the like web the first, yeah like and they were many years ahead of the next like major notable application of the web like they were just doing things that other people weren't doing right but even in like 2009 2010 2011 like that's around the time you know when you got Ang angular came out i think in 2011 or something i think or at least it started to become popular around then um, the first Angular, and um, you know, you had Backbone and and these sorts of things, and so it started to become more possible of what you can do, and just things have shifted, right? We've shifted from native applications to doing things on the web, not exclusively, but a, a lot of things. Yeah, and so the requirements have just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, and I think that will that trend will continue. That uh, that more things will come from native, and then also brand new things that we didn't even think of or or, or think would be a requirement, you know. I don't know what that is. If I did, I would be doing it because it would be a startup. <laughs> then I would make billions of dollars, right? So, exactly. Uh, but you know, is it? I can think of a, contrived examples like in a movie that aren't necessarily the reality. Which is like, you know, like what if the augmented reality takes off or something like that? That could significantly increase the complexities of how we build our e-commerce stores, right? Which seems crazy to think about, but what oh, if it's yeah. true? <laughs> you know, what if like you know, like, um, so. I mean, it certainly would be a lot harder. You, you ain't going to be writing your augmented reality in HTML. I mean, I'll tell you that right here. Exactly. I mean, just look at like Figma. I mean, Figma is written in C, but right. it's a full development suite in the browser, which is incredible. Now, that's not quite Jamstack, I would say. It's kind of, uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. It's it's a WASM uh, WebAssembly, but mm -hmm. still, like, it's amazing that something of that size and complexity could be 
delivered to a web browser. And, right. you know, we're not all right in that, but I think a yep. lot of what we're doing is, yeah. It's just more and more, you know, there's, as new things come out, users should expect more out of services and, you know, it just continues. That's how, yeah, that's how we stay, companies stay competitive <laughs> is they're up in the bar, you know, and doing the cool things. So speaking of companies and upping the bar, let's talk about edge slice rendering. And oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and it's actually, uh, this is a very, this is a problem we're going to have repeatedly, but it's it's actually re-rendering. And the reason Ooh. why that's really important to make a distinction is to, is to understand how, what it is and why it is a thing. So we have this um, technology called edge slice re-rendering. And as the name implies, this happens at the CDN edge. And the, the it's, it's a talk on its own sort of thing because it is a very complicated topic, but I'll give you the, the kind of elevator pitch without getting too, first getting too deep into the technology itself. But the elevator pitch is if you're using static site generation or doing caching heavily for your HTML, like with Remix or whatever it is, um, you got a problem. What about dynamic content? You still have dynamic content. And things that some people don't, cons things, dynamic content means anything literally that you need to change. And so that could be as simple as I need to change my pricing or my inventory or, or um, your cart count, like how many things are in your cart and, and all that stuff. Or it could be probably more of a big problem these days with as far as the performance side of things go is doing A-B testing and personalization. Like yeah. most e-commerce stores want to do if they're not already doing some sort of A-B testing or personalization and personalization scans, you know, spans the gamut, but like a, a just a simple, ex simple use case would be like, oh, you know, if I'm running a t-shirt store, online store, and I've got, you know, millions of different t-shirts I could possibly print for you. What t-shirts are going to be popular in, in, in um, Georgia are going to be very different than the, than the ones in Nebraska or very different than the ones in California or even California to New York. Like they're very different popularity of different trends and what's offensive, what's not offensive, these yeah. sorts of things. Like what's offensive in one state could be completely hilarious and funny and exactly what people <laughs> are looking for on a t-shirt in another state. Um, so it's best if you can personalize that based on what you think the viewer's location is. Um, and so doing those sorts of things is really hard in the Jamstack world. So what do people do? They move to, they keep the Jamstack, but they move to the client side. They, they mm -hmm. use client side mm -hmm. JavaScript. And the problem with that is client side JavaScript is slow. And that's the reason why we moved away from it to begin with. So you're like negating your whole benefit of moving to Jamstack unless you can completely defer that JavaScript until after the page is already visible and already loaded and everything. But the problem with that is, is so let's say is, is, it's basically the problem with it is above the fold content, right? So if it's, if it's in the viewport and a visible, let's say the hero section, almost every marketing website has one, right? A hero section, a top part where it has like a headline and an image and a call to action, right? That's something that you don't want to hide, right? You, that's something you, you, you shouldn't want to wait until JavaScript loads yeah to show to and then they, there's a, yeah, there's a popular thing in these, in these AB testing and personalization worlds called an anti flicker snippet, which is what exactly it, 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 it tries, it hides your HTML until the JavaScript is able to run, download the variations and then, or personalized content and then edit the HTML, which oh, come wow. like 100% just throws away any of the benefits that you had of doing static site generation. You're like, I wouldn't say 100%, but 90%. Right. Um, and a, in a lot of cases, it also, um, yeah, anyway, it's really slow for various reasons, third-party domains and, and downloading the wrong variations. And there's there's different takes on these sorts of things, and there's ways that you can improve the performance. But fundamentally, if you're doing it client-side, you have the problem of performance just in general. So do mobile devices, you know, like the benchmark standard, and at least right now, is a, a Motorola G4 phone using a 4G internet connection. That's like, you should be everyone's benchmark on mobile performance. And so you can use, like that's what like, you know, web dev dot, or web dot dev right. does the, the Lighthouse things, Lighthouse scores on the, the web vitals. But then there's also webpagetest.org, which will let you, it's a phenomenal, I mean, I can't tell you how, it's one of the best performance websites sure. that yeah. exists <laughs> for, for testing how fast, I can't believe it's a free service. It exactly. probably won't be forever. <laughs> Because because it's that awesome. Like you can actually then you know run these performance tests on these devices and look at you know get visual timelines, see the different resources and stuff like that. It's it's invaluable for testing these things. And um, 
Yeah, and then on that device, the benchmark is two seconds to try to largest contentful paint. So like basic, essentially that just means that like your page visually above the fold content should be pretty much done with some very, like very minor, not done, like, you know, like if maybe the letter th three in your cart or whatever hasn't yet been updated, that probably yeah. won't get counted against you in largest contentful paint. But um, vast majority of your con of it things should be done and visible and not moving and not shifting and changing colors and things like that um, within two seconds, which is almost in, like very few websites do be, yeah. meet that very few like that's what google <laughs> says tough. you should yeah, have sure. but it's it's like almost rare like to find a actual real world you could you can make a a contrived example right but then in the real world it's really tough so getting closest you can to that is is ultimately the goal but these client side things i haven't seen i'm sure maybe it exists but i have not seen a single one even with they do everything right, they do like without their client side thing, they get two seconds, so 1.7 seconds, phenomenal performance. As soon as they add that client side personalization or AB testing, it, it, it gets like the bank, the fastest I've ever seen was like 6.7 seconds or something like that, which is actually really fast. Most of the time I see like nine oh, to 12 oh, or 20, <laughs> like I'm beyond largest contentful. Wow. And even then that's still like, it's not unusual for me to profile um, a, someone's website and get 30 seconds plus for largest contentful on these devices. And the people just don't realize it because they're testing just on their desktop, on their fast internet, on their MacBook Pros. And, and it's like, yeah. if it's, if you can even notice it being slow on your fast MacBook Pro, on your fast internet, if you can even, even a little bit, then it's probably really slow on these other devices. So anyway, that tangent aside, so <laughs> that's that's the problem is, is basically you wanna be able to have caching Forget Jamstack for a second, just caching in general. You want to be able to cache HTML at the CDN, but you still want dynamic content. What do you do? Client side. It's the only thing you had historically. So we came up with the technology to solve this problem. So you don't have to do it client side. So basically, you will cache, your, your HTML will get cached at the CDN edge. And then we're able to make the minimum amount of modifications needed at the CDN edge on top of that cached HTML so that it can be the most performant and we don't have to send you know, the variations to the client and wait for the whole JavaScript song and, song and dance. Now, that, that sounds super simple, but how does that work with something like React where like you have a mental model of components and you have a mental, and you have like rehydration, like you can't, you, it, you could just like, oh, I'm on the CDN and I just use a query selector and then I just replace the content right there. Well, you got two problems. One, React is just going to blow it away when it rehydrates. That's the biggest <laughs> problem. Like yeah. it literally will just blow the change away and you'll get and it's gone. That's the biggest problem. Well, one of the problems. The second one is maintainability. What if like if you if you wanted to, you know, if, if all you wanted to do is change the, the text content of a span, you could put an ID on it ahead of time set it and forget it and then make like a hack or something so that it works. You could come up with some sort of hack to um, make hydration work, um, which is not easy to do just to be clear, but it is possible. Um, that's fine, but that's not necessarily the most maintainable thing in the world. Like, like in the sense of how, how are you getting your, how are your marketers going and, and modifying that headline? How are, how are people like, what if you didn't have the foresight to make that headline have an ID on it or something like that, that you could target to begin with? Um, and who and who are these people who are like maintaining their ed, this edge code and this massive frame? Like you'd have to make a framework and all this other stuff. So we basically have tried to take the complexity out of that problem um, by coming up with edge slice rerendering. And so how edge slice rerendering? What it is 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 you you have the mental model. Right now we only support React, but we're going to support other things later. Right now we support React. You have the mental model of being able to override a prop, any props of a, of a particular component. So like if you've got like a hero section component, you could decide I wanna override one of those props, like the headline prop or the image prop or whatever it is, whatever prop you wanna override for it. And we know what the minimum amount of work needed to change as if you, to change the, the resulting HTML as if you would have actually re-rendered the entire component. So that means it's not just find and replace. If you had provided the headline and then inside the inside the component, you had called two uppercase on that headline, you're able to provide a new headline and it will get two uppercase exactly how it would have done if you would have re-rendered the entire component. But re-rendering the entire component can be slow because the higher up the component is in the tree, in your application tree, the more work that would need to be done. 
And we don't want to have server-side rendering. There's a reason why people don't do server-side rendering. It's also slow, relatively speaking, yeah. right? Because you're just, it's death by a thousand. It like, even if you don't have massive lists, it's still death by a thousand cuts when you're doing server-side rendering. So what edge slicing rendering does is it uses static analysis ahead of time during your build process to figure out if you were to change any given prop, what would what would be the JavaScript I would have to run to, to generate a new value? And where exactly on the page will this resulting new value go? And what do I need to do? Is it an attribute? Is it a list of, uh, of items that I need to re-render? Like, what is it? Um, is it style on, on something or something like that? And so that that's what, so you, you as a, are able to have that mental model. And I know this is very, is this approach is completely unlike anything that, that, you know, any product, anything people have seen. So it's, it's, it's really hard to wrap your head around, but the mental model is essentially, you can override any of the props at the edge and it will perform much better than just server side rendering. In fact, in practice, we haven't seen, we haven't seen a case yet. You can make contrived examples, but I haven't yet seen a practical actual case yet where you can even measure the performance difference. So like if if you're able to if we're able to oh, serve wow. your your HTML from the CDN cache without any personalization or dynamic content, if we're able to serve that in 30 milliseconds, we'll also be able to personalize it or do A/B testing in 30 milliseconds. Like you know, thing, the internet varies, right, and locations vary and all that stuff. But the point being is, it's it it gets rid of so much of it's able to just do the very minimal amount of work needed while still keeping a really good mental model and a maintainable mental model. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we think it's a, it's a really exciting approach and the folks you know, that we've been working with thus far, we're just recently coming, we've been working with folks for over a year, but we're just recently coming out of stealth mode and opening up to more folks. Um, this is the, just to be clear, this is something that we do it out smartly. This is the startup that me and my friend Shalom and Emily um, were co-founders of. Um, that is so, pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, you know, I don't want to, you know, we don't have to go super deep into it, but because I've got two talks, one at NextJS Conf and one at Gatsby Conf that go much, you know, they show examples and, and might go deeper. And, and, um, if you're lost, if anyone like listening to this is lost, you're not, you're not alone. I mean, it's a very, it's a complicated thing. The point, the, the takeaway essentially should be if you're using react, we've got a really great way to do dynamic content and personalization and AB testing and that sort of thing that just performs screaming screaming fast um you know it's not and it's not without it's not without compromise right there's 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 always going to be a compromise in any technology you use and i i am I'm, I'm the type of person who likes to be a little more forthright about compromises instead of trying to hide them like i'm not going to you know go through every possible permutation but just like the most obvious compromise is the the way you 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 do things is by overriding props and so if something isn't a prop you can't override it like, like yeah. not, not currently at least you know there's talk about supporting the ability to override contexts and stuff like that but that does not exist currently um so that's like you know it it, it, it this is this also does not lend itself well to the it well there is no there is no like optimizely style like marketer WYSIWYG where like someone can go in and just completely oh, change yeah. anything <laughs> on the page, which is a good thing, but some people need it, right? Some people, it, yeah. and, and I think I, we're not, those things will continue to exist until the end of time. Like there are use cases for them and even, and we're performing, you know, those will exist and that's not what we're trying to do. But what you can do is you can actually meet the marketers halfway in a way that we've so far found that they are like perfectly happy with. And in some cases actually more happy with, and that's headless, right? So integrate yeah. in with your, like integrate in your, your, your contentful, your, your, your segments, your, whatever your headless thing is integrated in with your, with your overrides in this edge slice re-rendering. And now if they want to do an AB test, they just go to Contentful. They go to Contentful. They pick the variations from their existing content model. They, or if they want to personalize something, you know, you set up a persona model, and you and so like, oh, these are like we're like we did a proof of concept with ButcherBox recently that we showed on on Gatsby oh, Gatsby nice. uh, Gatsby Conf, where they've got this recipe blog that they're not doing any personal. They're not. They're basically using it purely for SEO purposes, which is great, but they're not doing any sort of personalization related to it. So someone, if someone comes in and looks at a recipe for lobster, and then they go to your website from a, from a link that you provide them or whatever for ButcherBox, and you're showing them steaks 
are they likely to convert? Of course not. <laughs> or you're staying, you're showing them not, not, I wouldn't say of course not, but I mean like they're, if you show them a, a promotion for steaks, they're not going to care. They're, they care. I mean, they might care, but chances are they right. care about lobster. But if you exactly. actually are running a promotion on lobster and you can show that, you know that, and you're like, Oh, they just came from a recipe page for lobster. Wouldn't they want to know that there's that they can save ten percent off? Like they they came to Butcher Box, right? They came to your website to learn about what it is, and 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 um, so that those sorts of things. Um, so, anyways, but my point of that example is that you know you, once you set up the persona models, then the marketers and the product people can continue to add new ones. They can be like, oh, now we support. Um, trying to think of. I mean, there's because there's steaks and, and pork and stuff. Let's say they didn't support pork at first, but they're like later, like, oh, we want to add a new persona, a person who likes pork. And boom, you just you add that in contentful and then everything. And then you and then you can go in and tag products. You can say, like, oh, this product or this image, I want it to be shown when someone likes pork or, and what have you. And um, so doing those sorts of things, you know, in to some marketers, that's actually the better thing than, than the WYSIWYG thing. Like, because WYSIWYG can be very oh, yeah, difficult. Like less work. If you have, <laughs> yeah, I mean, especially if you have, you have to learn about, because, you know, the Optimize -E and these other products have tried to hide HTML and CSS, but at the end of the day, a lot of things just can't be done unless you learn the very basics of like selectors and HTML, um, especially once things, things fall apart, especially when you get mobile involved and responsive. Oh, yeah. And, it's just really easy to break the thing. And um, yeah. So. so that leads me maybe to probably our last question, <laughs> which is, it sounds to me like technology, you know, coming out with these edge workers maybe is what really enabled this um, to happen. And because we don't have, you know, what we were talking about earlier, which is these, automatically, you know, um, optimized kind of for the least amount of JavaScript possible, you know, we don't have that technology yet. Right. Um, so like edge workers is what, you know, enabled this. Yeah. What's... So e even in the world where you have that technology, you still, you don't want to rely on, on client side JavaScript. Right. So, and, and you, yeah. there's, there's no, and you also don't want to just like anyway, but the, yeah, edge workers. Um, it, it was a major component of it is a major component of this. Being able to have computation close to the edge in where the cache is is a pretty much fundamental to the technique. Um, it's not just that. I mean, like because we have the compiler well, yeah, stuff, the code, the code stuff. slicing, <laughs> all that stuff. So, but absolutely, without that, the benefit is significantly less. And you know, Cloudflare has been leading the way with that. They're ahead of the game. All the CDNs know it. They're all playing catch up. Um, and I think that they will, in fact, catch up. But um, but yeah, I mean, like I'm 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 excited for that. I'm excited for Fastly and Netlify and Akamai and all the others who are doing it um, to catch up and for edge compute to be much more um, accessible. It's still. Right now, edge compute is not used that much because it is still a very like it's like here's a raw compute platform. Good luck, um, <laughs> and, and it's it's uh, and when I say good luck. I mean it's like tooling isn't you know Express doesn't run on half these things or most on most of these. Uh, actually, I don't think I can think of any actual true edge compute platform where Express actually runs. But you know there's just there's no it lacks abstractions and it lacks. Um, lots of people, examples and things like that. There's some, right? And it's a growing community, but it's still really difficult. And that's also part of what we do do. It's secondary to the edge flexi rendering stuff. But since, you know, we might as well, we, we do provide abstractions around that as well for making it much easier to, to like have your API at the edge or modify the HTML random. Like, like, like we have um, middle concept of middleware as well. And where you can like, we've got like an image optimizer middleware. We've got like an HTTP push middleware where it will like detect the things that it should be HTTP pushing automatically, which contrary to popular belief, as long as you actually do, if you do cut, so, oh, so HTTP push is this new thing. I guess I got to explain. So HTTP push yeah, go ahead. was this new thing with HTTP2 that allows you to push a resource to the browser before it requests it, which sounds wild, and it is. Um, in practice, what a lot of people have found is that it's not easy to get right. And Chrome tried recently to, to they announced that they actually didn't try. They announced that they were going to remove it. <laughs> 
and <laughs> like remove the that. ability to do it. And uh, as one might expect, there was pushback, um, and they have reverted their their at least their current thought because essentially they're saying like they're saying we're going to remove this thing and there's no other way to do the exact same thing like there's no equivalent better way because it has flaws and it does have flaws it's difficult to understand difficult to use difficult to get right difficult to, to measure and like it requires it's not that but you can't it's not that you can't do it it's not that you can't get tremendous benefit out of it like right. we've seen cases where we could shave off an entire second on the motor g4 just by doing the right push um, sort of things, wow. especially when it comes to like fonts and images that are above the fold and these sorts of things. So, um, but you can also really get it wrong. Like it's yeah. super tempting to be like, I could see that. <laughs> like, like some of these frameworks, I won't name them, you know, over or over aggressive in their preloading and their pushing and stuff. And then you get contention. You can't preload everything because then you're not preloading anything. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> so, um, and so you do have to be careful. Um, and so we aim to, Try, I mean, that's why we're called out smartly is we're trying to basically come up with things that are really, we're trying to solve problems that are really difficult to do and solve them then with, in, with intelligent related things, whether that's compilers or machine learning or things that just, I mean, even if it's just a database of conditionals, you know, fancy machine, not really machine learning, <laughs> um, those sorts of things, right? Just like, because there's a lot of things that are really difficult to do without a ton of experience that it's like, we could just, do once and, and then you can just install it and use it and, and be done with it. You don't have to become an expert in how do you HTTP push, right? Just like service workers. Service workers is a great example of not, we don't, we know nothing, we don't do anything with service workers, but service workers are a great example where if you use them wrong, it's really detrimental. It can be it's really, really detrimental. <laughs> and so, um, you know, work, Workbox has tried, Workbox is a library by the Google folks to try and mitigate that. And I think they've done a, I mean, they've done a phenomenal job, but it's still not quite there. Um, it's still really easy to shoot yourself in the foot to some extent. But but even the job they've done, that's the whole the whole shtick is that you shouldn't need to be you shouldn't have to become an expert in, in service workers to use them. And um, just like so, that's the same thing that we're trying to do is not service workers though, just with other technologies, um, yeah. trying to make things trying to make your think your website fast. Basically, all the things we focus on is so that your site can be faster. Well, like, what else could we want? Yeah. <laughs> That's all, that's all the, the things we care about. And so um, I heard a hint of something in there, maybe about, you know, some frameworks or something that y'all are, y'all could help the community out with. Well, I mean, we, we, we have done tons of experiments and tons of different things and some things will eventually open source a lot of, I would say that we're, we're a very R and D centric company. We, we um, have tried a lot of different things that are completely unrelated to the things we've talked today, but all related to performance, um, including like we did, like I was saying before, we did the, the you know, we have a proof of concept that statically analyzes your code and then gets rid of the JavaScript that isn't needed to to render it client side, like the, the React code that isn't needed. So essentially wow. a basic, like if your entire page was HTML and didn't need like if, if, you read a, if you wrote a React app and then the entire page ends up not needing any JavaScript, then quite literally no JavaScript would be sent. Um, and so then it you know, sprinkles in, but there's difficulties around it. And, and um, especially when it comes to like roots and stuff like React, limitations around how React works currently, some of which React is working on removing and, and, and providing different primitives for that would open, because they want to open these sorts of things up. Server components is something that you mentioned that the React team is working on. It used to be called React Flight, or well, at least it was part of that. And um, that is basically the same, it's similar idea, except for it just, you have to do it manually and it's still, yeah. it's designed around server-side rendering. Um, but they are actually very interested, they have not yeah, done anything around this, but they're very interested in, in making, seeing if they can make server components work in a static site generation world. There was a person, you might have caught that on Twitter, there was a person who did like a hacky prototype of that. They like hacked server components in React to work with static site generation. Was that uh, um, Microsite? Was that somebody else? I can't remember the person's name. I couldn't tell you. I can only remember that it, it's it's the most memorable thing about it is that the hack had to involve like embedding the embedding JSON into an image on the page and then de like it's, oh, whoa. it's like okay. crazy yeah, ridiculous hack. Then. No, right. Yeah, and it's like it's like a crazy like do not do this in production sort of hack. Interesting. But um, but yeah, there, I mean, I think there's a lot of exciting things, and I think we'll continue to experiment and 
spend a bunch of time and then some things will come to fruition and some things won't. We, that's kind of the nature of our company is that we, that we um, secretly will spend it, not secretly in the sense of we, I have no interest in like, like sometimes I might tease to, 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 to in a sense of like, Oh, here's a funny thing I'm doing. Like I, I do that kind of often is like tease about funny things I'm doing, but I know mm -hmm. I'm never going to be like, Oh, we're coming out with a pro. I wouldn't say never. I would never, oh, I gotta be very careful with my words because <laughs> someone will call me on this later. Uh, I try really hard to not like be like, we're coming out with this X product. And then we never come out with that product yeah. but because I said that way too early, like way before I even knew we could do that product sort of thing. Cause vaporware I've, you know, I've done vaporware on accident um, back when I did open source more and stuff like that, like on accident in the sense of like, you get a proof of concept and then you're like, great, this right, is going to be excited. easy. And then, and then the, the, in practice you find out it's not. So, um, so yeah, we, we, we will have a lot of experiments that just don't come to fruition, but. Well, I think regardless, we're excited to see what y'all come out with. Um, yeah. I think the community as a whole could benefit from, a lot of what you're doing. Yeah, so, we hope so. Very cool, man. Um, any last words on on the Jamstack? Yeah, I'm curious. Like, what is what are the folks at this dot seeing? Like, you guys are on the ground, right? Working with these people. Like, are you seeing other trends? I'd be very interested in knowing what, what sort of trends you're seeing. Are is it are people like? Does everyone know what Jamstack is? Are people moving towards Jamstack, or is there like? Is it just all all hype? I think that the general trend is people are moving that way. Um, I think it's slower than people would want it to be. <laughs> so I think there is like some affordances that, um, you know, like you get from it that we talked about earlier that developers want. And so it's like, how do we get our company there? There's, you know, there's a bit of a buy-in required. And I think maybe that's where people are struggling the most. Um, yeah. But I think the people that are open to it um, and able to actually get in and see, okay, what can it do for our company? I think they're actually surprised sometimes um, by just on multiple fronts, like the performance benefits, the developer productivity benefits. And a lot of times um, there is some complexity that's maybe different than what they're used to, but I think it's, it's shifted and it's a lot, it's a lot more, um, oh, what's the right word? it's worth the cost of, you know, the mm -hmm. productivity benefits and the performance. Um, is there a way to increment, like have, this is one thing I don't have, have an answer to. Is there a way to incrementally adopt the Jamstack that you guys have seen that was worked well? Um, Cause what we've done, like, I don't what know we've, if I what can we tried to do is like, like for folks who are doing Shopify, who are moving from like Shopify liquid sites to Jamstack, one of the things we've done and it works, it can work well depending on the page is, is just, essentially at the CDN layer, you know, either serve the, the Jamstack version or the, the Shopify version, right? The liquid mm -hmm. rendered thing for different pages. But that, like, that's, that only works in very specific cases, right? Like, like a very, and also only very, very specific sorts of, um, I guess, cases kind of in, in, envelops everything. But um, I'm, I'm thinking more along the lines of like, someone has written, like, they're on, I don't want to pick on a framework. God, um, uh, they're on uh, actually, yeah, they're on React, but they're just on Create React App or something like an old version of Create React App. The client side, everything's client side, and they want to move to Jamstack. Like, how would you? What would you tell a person oh, if they man. want to do that? Um, good luck. That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> I think so spend um, some time. You know, yeah, like there, know. there are kind of what you were getting at maybe, um, I think it was, I think it's Netlify, but or I'm sure other places like Purcell and other things have it too, but kind of there's like path proxying where, you know, you could potentially like kind of what you were saying earlier, like serve one app or the other app and you could kind of slowly, um, pull it over you know, one page at a time or something like that. Mm -hmm. So um, you have two apps, essentially. You got your old app. And yeah. Your app. I feel yeah. like that's probably that's the best answer. I don't know if there's anything better out there. That's a good question. Yeah. Maybe something for our listeners to send in if they, uh, if they know the answer. So I think that's the, like you said, the biggest about the, it being slow, like the transition being slow, um, like, or I guess in the transition, the adoption being slow. 
um, it's just that is that people just don't have time to and 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 um, they just can't just stop what they're doing and rewrite their website every couple of years like yeah. a lot of people want to do. Some people do do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think like a lot of people are moving, uh, at least moving to more of an API model um, at mm -hmm. the very least, and so with that, they can start to at least move to the Jamstack, but. I don't know if they're all there yet. Yeah. Well, Jay, it's been very fun. Yeah. And thanks. I've had fun too. To come on. Um, hopefully, we can see you back once you have some cool new thing that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Is ready. Absolutely. That'd be great. Um, okay. So next month, we're going to have Dustin and Jesse, and they will be interviewing Stackbit, which is a cool new startup doing um kind of a uh build your own jam stack in the browser so pick mm. your cms pick your static site generator and off to the races stack so bit cool. yeah i hadn't heard of them i'm gonna take a look at it right after this yeah, check them out <laughs> the name sounds super similar to stack blitz and so i gotta be really yeah, careful about what I'm, what I'm saying oh it's i've actually apparently been to their website before because it's it's purple on google so nice <laughs> I don't remember when I was there, but apparently I have been there. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us, Jay. It was a pleasure talking to you. Pleasure too. Thank you, everyone. And uh, I'm Hunter Miller. I won't be hosting next time, but hopefully I see you all again soon. <laughs>